Uh, still, everybody's here. Anyway, so so we simply continue. So so I hope you saw my excitement for the chiral anomaly, so which uh, nicely was introduced by Charlie. And uh, so as I said, so we can have uh, wild points at low symmetry points. So we have materials which have no inversion symmetry. So uh, or we can break time reversal symmetry by applying a magnetic field in Dirac semi-metals, so we could make them while. So then, but we might uh, have not a big effect by applying a magnetic field. But all the crossing in the band structure of a fairy magnet, so the fairy magnets are white points. This is already very nice because uh, there's an inflation. And so recently, we also thought we find the ideal while where the, uh, it's a ferromagnetic compound, it's europium, cadmium, to arsenic, too, because it has not too many other bands, you know. So we, uh, because very often, so, uh, despite also crossing points, you have many other bands crossing, and then you could have problems to argue with the referee where are the properties coming from. Okay, so anyway, so there, this is why I think uh, this magnetic material, and you already see, so I will only briefly uh, tip it because this is what we did, so the materials we are working on. But, uh, uh, and this is a very, very nice review which we wrote. Uh, so we really had to re write it by ourselves without a PhD student or postdoc who helps us, me, with a latte or something. Like, this was an adventure, no, Andre? Our paper here. <laughs> anyway, so, uh, so there should be much more out there. Uh, and I am exactly thinking, despite of the interesting physics, you can have like axions, finding axion electron dynamic in this magnetic material and the quantum anomaly soil effect. So there's also low hanging fruits, I always call this, where I think, uh, uh, so we are writing a lot of patents on this materials, I have to say, okay? So where you can find interesting properties because of the giant response of the uh, material. So, and, so this was the article uh, where, where uh, we looked with Andre's uh, team and uh, so for magnetic materials and we, in this sense we also grouped them in certain groups of materials and this were antiferromagnetic material and if you see the group of material you see that there are many uh, materials where people already worked intensively on like the iron plectides because of the interesting superconducting properties of some of the condo systems and so on and this is the reason also the crystal structures of inorganic materials are made very often, or most of the 199% probably at room temperature. So, but we are looking for the properties very often at much lower temperature. So we don't know exactly whether they still have the same crystal structure. And the other thing is, uh, so, um, so sometimes they are made by powders and these are the reliable anti-ferromagnets. And therefore they are mainly materials where people already worked on because uh, for, uh, getting neutron data and really the magnetic structure, you need quite big crystals, and this is a lot of effort. So therefore, it's only a small uh, uh, group of materials. So, but I think already from from this group of material, one can learn a lot and make a lot of conclusions. Okay, so like, um, and uh, some of the materials were already predicted here. Uh, before, so with a nice band inversion, so this uh, very simple sodium chloride type of material, but they have elements which uh, probably are so radioactive that nobody can grow them. So we, we, we can do uranium, but uh, nothing else. But you see here, you can even have, uh, here this is an example of plutonium telluride and americium. This is a ferromagnetic, not anti-ferromagnetic. You already can see the band inversion and here for plutonium telluride, this would even have a larger gap as bismuth telluride, but nobody, uh, it was really difficult. So we know in America they have a sample, in Germany they could measure so, but it's not possible to carry plutonium samples. <laughs> so I remember that uh, Shushi and I tried to convince him. <laughs> it was really hard. But beyond of this, you also have antiferromagnetic compounds in this class of mat uh, material is the same as, uh, and they show higher order topological uh, insulators. So if you look more deeper in something, uh, it uh, immediately shows something interesting. Anyway, so as I said, I'm interested in this class of materials so for magnetism. I think it's a very nice class of materials, the Heusler compounds, which are related more or less structurally, if you want to do 
uh, with uh, the semiconductors. So like this is here, the crystal structure from mercury telluride. You have more or less two interpenetrating FCC lattices and this tetrahedral arrangement of the electron. So uh, like this, if this red ball would be green, it's silicon, but then you can make it uh, two atoms like gallium arsenic or uh, mercury telluride. And uh, so, so it's uh, not a big step to say, look, instead of uh, two FCC lattices, you can have three or four FCC lattices. Then you have really a very dense material close packed and this are a class of material which are called Holzdorf compounds, and they can be semiconducting, but also can be very nice magnets, which have magnetic properties much higher than room temperatures. This is why I got into this material a long time before topology. Uh, oops, no, this doesn't work. Okay, and they are very nice, so we, we just wrote a, uh, Review also for the MRS. So they, they, they are kind of model system. You can have them as a model system because they can have a, a simple band inversion like a topological insulator like mercury telluride. They are very good white semi metals, but they can have also a topology in real space like skirmions and uh, non collinear spin structures, which show very interesting properties. And my question is still the relation between real space and reciprocal space. So because we need Barry also for looking for skirmions. And their first work now, and this is, I always want to give you some ideas for the future work for the young generation. There's a first work also on some, I think, on some um, recent Nature paper where they really make a connection between the non-collinear uh, spin structure in real space and wild physics in reciprocal space, okay? So, and I think this is really amazing if you can find Y physics in the reciprocal space, like we find a giant anomalous Nernst effect, for example, at the same time, we already can predict the magnetic structure and the non-collinear magnetic structure in reciprocal space leading to skirmions, which we maybe can use for a new, new kind of memory. So therefore, I still think that uh, very lot of uh, things which we can still explore. Okay, so, and uh, as I said, the Häusler compounds. Uh, so this is very nice because they are so tunable because we can simply makes many elements on many positions here, and we get always the same simple cubic structure or slightly distorted uh, cubic structures, but it's really nice because we can here turn on and off all the knobs we want. We can make it ferromagnetic, ferromagnetic, anti-ferromagnetic, soft magnetic, hard magnetic. So, and the reason why I went into this field is more because I was interested in spintronics and uh, did a lot of also with companies like IBM and Western Digital, and now you know why I'm married to Stuart Parking. Okay, finally, his hot Häusler compounds are useful for spintronics. Okay, because they have uh, uh, very high temperatures. Okay, and the nice thing is why are these materials oh. um, named after this guy, this German guy? So it's like, so this is the uh, Häusler was a family who had a copper mine. Uh, so this uh, copper mine, they they mixed with manganese and they made uh, thermocouples as a company. But they were also interested in doing science, even having this company, Häusler company. So he mixed privately then at home, like made experiments putting aluminum and other elements to this. And uh, if you have a hard magnet, like here, this uh, uh, hard magnet, so if you would try to uh, attract copper or manganese, aluminum, nothing would happen. But after he mixed them all together, it became a very magnetic material at room temperature. So this was the reason why this class of material was named after Häusler. So, and um, these materials are even, as I said, even with this four FCC lattices with this uh, composition two to one to one, we can make simple semiconductors like lithium to uh, gallium uh, uh, antimony by simply counting to eight like gallium arsenic, you can distribute it over four elements. But you can also have, uh, like mercury telluride, which you include D electrons, like you can have uh, uh, semiconductors. But you can also have semiconductors which are made by iron, vanadium, and aluminum, and they are non-magnetic semiconductors. So this nice thing of these compounds are you count the electrons and you know the properties, okay? Because they all have the same band structure, 
Okay, so at eight valence electrons we have a gap. At eighteen valence electrons we have a gap. Then we have the d electrons, and we have uh, at twenty-four valence electrons a gap. Okay, and so this means we have many non-magnetic semiconductors <laughs> in the class of material, and this is as amazing as a compound copper two manganese aluminium, where you have non-magnetic elements mix them together, get a ferromagnet at room temperature. Here it makes fifty percent of a ferromagnet with something else, and you get a non-magnetic uh, semiconductor. Okay, so it's a good thermoelectric material. But then if you ad add additional electrons, and this is a nice thing of this material, it seems to be they only go in one spin direction. Okay? So it's like here we have 12 electrons, there we have 12 electrons, we have an insulator, a semiconductor, we have a band gap here, and we have the same number of spins in one direction and in the other, therefore we have no magnetism. But if we now move the density of states of one spin direction versus the other uh, direction, we would end up with people in spintronics light, so to have this half metallic ferromagnet where you have a band gap in one spin direction and the met metal in the other spin direction. So we only have for transport only one spin. Okay? So having a spin polarized current is a dream of spintronics. Okay? So, but you know, then you have disorder and get into trouble. And uh, anyway, so but I think this could be realized also in topological materials, spin polarized currents eventually in Cairo. Anyway, so uh, here you can do it by uh, putting then making a different combination, like instead of iron, you put cobalt, this has then um, one electron more. So you have then two electron more per formula unit or even add more. And then you have this half metallic ferromagnet. So you have uh, this 24 electrons to fill this bulk kind of states. And then you have four electrons additionally there. And this is exactly what you measure here. So you measure then really the magnetization. If you count the electrons in this material, you make a compound with 25 electrons. You have one mu bore, what you measure as saturation magnetization. If you make a compound with 28, you measure four. So you always have this half metallic band structure. But the nice thing is also, if you switch one spin direction versus the other, you I increase the exchange coupling and you increase this is the Curie temperature in a simple approximation. And you can see you can make magnets which have a Curie temperature like 1200 K. So, uh, so this is really, if you want to think about room temperature application, you can imagine I like this class of material in magnetism. So because it can make really high temperature uh, uh, ferromagnets. And this is why here people worked like me, also on tunneling magneto resistance effect, because the idea is if you have this half metallic ferromagnet, you can have uh, a layer here and a layer there, and some insulating layer or a metallic layer, depending on you want to which kind of uh, magnetic device you want to make. And then if they have the same uh, 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 magnetic orientation, the layers you have a current, and if you switch the orientation, you have insulating behavior because. You, the electrons cannot flow because of their high spin polarization. And this is what we did for a long time, you see, until 2010, then I moved into topology. Okay? I canceled all my collaboration with Western Digital, <laughs> IBM, and Hitachi. And uh, here's the last work with Hitachi, so having hoistless in a retail of a whatever. So because then people found, then I came into contact, as I said, with uh, Shushen, so Stuart, it was his fault, he introduced me to Shushen and I left Spintronics for topology. Okay, so but now we came back, luckily, after the prediction of Andre, uh, that he found, oh, Claudia Soisler, they have a very nice crossing points here at the Fermi energy. So like every crossing in the paramagnet is a, um, a white semi-metal. But here we have the Fermi energy just below the fer uh, zero is here, so it's slightly above. And we try still to avoid to make materials which uh, have uh, to be doped because then you might get into more trouble. So, and here it's a cubic compound, so you have nodal lines in all three dimensions. Here in three dimensions, this is a Bryan zone of this FCC based compound. And if you apply then a magnetic field in a certain direction, and you still have a large number of white points, it's not the ideal white, even it looks quite uh, nice here because of the half metallicity. There is, uh, there is not so many bands crossing the zero line. Okay. Anyway, so when, when I saw this paper, I thought, okay, Jürgen Kübler and me, we did a lot of nice work, theoretically, partially. So, and uh, also uh, during times of, uh, of uh, spintronics, we found that uh, so the Heuslers, at a certain point, the people in spintronic believed 
that the anomalous Hall conductivity in magnetic materials goes with the magnetization um, until Nagosa brought it into context with the Berry curvature. So at this time, without thinking about topology, we calculated simply Berry curvature of magnetic Hoyslers, and we found that some of the compounds have giant values. And in this paper already, which was published in uh, EP, uh, EP, no, this was this very early EPL. So we, we, we recognized that if you have a crossing, this anti-crossing, which was also mentioned already in Nagosa's paper, uh, without talking about why, that you can have then this giant effect. So we made a patent on this, okay? So we have a patent for Hall sensor on this giant value, but this was before topology. But now you can say you have nice very curvature, giant uh, uh, responses, and you have very nice white points in this material. Anyway, so, so in general, then uh, you can uh, even say so uh, that not only the anomalous Hall conductivity, if you have crossings in this ferromagnet leads to, you have a large Berry curvature, you have a large anomalous Hall conductivity, and so there's also a relation between the uh, Berry curvature and the uh, the Nernst effect, so this is the first derivative. So we like this also because you can imagine now if you have a wide crossing, you know, so if you measure the Nernst effect and the Nernst effect is spread over a wider range of energy, so this is uh, here only this window, sorry, but still, uh, it's easier to identify wide points. I told you it's sometimes difficult to find the wide points because they might be hidden in, uh, at along symmetry lines of your Brian zone where we don't look, because we only look for the high, uh, high symmetry points in this band structure plots, okay? Okay, this was like, uh, then you, and it's amazing, I think, how the uh, Hall effect and the Nernst effect really works. The prediction works quite well, you know. Anyway, you have a kind of variation in the Nernst effect a little bit more, but, uh, so, uh, sorry. So uh, this was the theoretical prediction here. So anyway, the first thing what you do is like, and this we did here with Hassan together to look whether you really have your nice crossing. So in this compound, since it's a soft magnet, we cannot uh, we measure more or less this up as this situation, not this situation, because in Engelgrove soft photo emission, we cannot apply magnetic field. But you see this nice nodal line in this compound and the corresponding drum head states in this compound. This is the first thing, as normally we check is the Fermi energy really where we expected that we really can predict this. And then we measured the Hall and uh, the uh, anomalous Hall. So I think uh, uh, nice, so this is a sketch which uh, I want to show you simply to, uh, so I already into, uh, introduced the Hall measurement. You apply simply a magnetic field and you measure the current. And if you have a magnetic material, they have intrinsically magnetic moments. So therefore you measure an additional term to the Hall effect, this is this anomalous Hall effect, which is related to the Berry curvature, which we know now. In the past, people thought it goes with the magnetization, which is in some sense not so, uh, so, so, so surprising. So I remember times when people were mainly talking about magnetization and anomalous Hall effect. And this is the measurement you do then. So you measure uh, here the. Uh, uh, conductivity or resistivity, as we hear the conductivity as a function of a magnetic field. And you see a similar behavior what you see normally in your squid measurement. If you measure the magnetic properties, therefore people thought so all at the beginning it goes with magnetization. So you have the ordinary Hall contribution, but this additional jump. And this jump is for this material very large. And also the Hall angle, what people like in spintronic, so is very large, so surprisingly larger than what people saw bef be before. And uh, then you can argue, is this really an intrinsic effect? And thanks to also here, this paper of Nagosan. So you can really, is, uh, there are some ways, if you uh, measure uh, here the Hall conductivity, rho xy versus xx and so on, uh, then you can distinguish whether it's really in this intrinsic area of the Berry phase. And you will see many of the materials we are interested in the topological materials are in this intrinsic uh, range because the Berry effect is so large, okay, that even if you have disorder in the material, you would not see it. Okay, so it's really orders of magnitude larger than what people see normally in normal magnetic compounds. Okay, 
And then we did the anomalous noise effect, and also the anomalous noise effect in this cobalt manganese gallium is high. So here you have the noise coefficient as a function of magnetization, and this is the reason because the people always believed it goes with the magnetization. But you see all this topological material, I will show data here, they are orders of magnitude higher than, uh, so than what was known before. So this is also something really new, you know? So as the, uh, uh, where people now really make a career on measuring nurse effect and so on. So we now even have materials where we come in the range where the figure of merit is larger than of thermoelectric material. So, but I think there is still to look and here, is, it, this is from Nagasuchi's group, they are more or less doing all the materials now on trying to, 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 to make really devices and uh, I think they are having a series of patent on uh, different topological materials. Okay, so, but I want to give you another example uh, uh, of an antiferromagnet and very curvature in this magnetic material because this is also a big field of uh, uh, now uh, where people do a lot of research also on this material, uh, manganese 3 tin and manganese 3 germanium, um, especially also Nagasuchi's group and spintronic people and this is like, uh, so why did we work on this? So if you have the Häusler compound, so you can have also, uh, uh, if you see the phase diagram of this cubic uh, crystal, so they can also tetragonally uh, distort. And then it's interesting for hard magnetic materials and we did work on TMR there, but they also have uh, competition with the hexagonal phase if the distortion is along the one, one, one direction. And in the hexagonal phase, the atoms are arranged like a Kagome lattice, and people are very interested in this Kagome lattice because in case of antiferromagnet, you have uh, frustration, but it's a metal, so it's really uh, a stainless metal, and you have this, uh, the corresponding electronic structure. And eventually, people are talking about this as like, uh, so people looking for flat bands nowadays for having correlation. So you have a Van Hofer singularity, which people like me like to already during time of high temperature superconductors because they have all very nice Van Hofer singularities and nesting. And you have this crossing point, Dirac cones and Weib cones. Therefore, they are interested. Interesting. So um, normally, an antiferromagnet, if you look for the anomalous Hall effect of an antiferromagnet because of symmetry consideration, this is a Häusler compound, an antiferromagnet, you see here, the, uh, the Berry curvature for each spin direction, they are totally compensated over the whole energy range. And it was believed for a long time that an antiferromagnet has no anomalous Hall conductivity. There's no Berry curvature in the antiferromagnets. So, uh, so when we look for manganese uh, 3 tin and gallium at this time, which is a topological antiferromagnet, so, uh, so we thought, uh, we found that this compound has a Berry curvature, Jürgen Kuppler and me, and uh, we discussed this with Stuart Parking, Stuart, and Stuart said, look, this is total bullshit. You know, an antiferromagnet has no Berry curvature, an antiferromagnet has no animal solid effect. You did something wrong with your paper. But then, Anne McDonald saw similar things in manganese 3 iridium and manganese 3 platinum compound where it was not experimentally yet verified, so we published our paper in EPL and his paper in EPRL. And then we had the samples, and again, Stuart said, oh, I think your samples are dirty. You see this very nice uh, anomaly soil effect, this very nice jump here, but I don't believe this. But Nagasuchi, at the same time, also followed the prediction, and he thought also, so we were allowed finally to publish. So on this paper, Stuart and Ben Hai, we removed their name still on the theory paper, yeah, because they said it's wrong. <laughs> Here, they are on the paper already. Okay. Anyway, but this is very nice, because having an antiferromagnet where you can switch the domains, it's like now they, this uh, group is really doing a lot now, even in direction of devices, because you can switch the orientation. And the nice thing is now going back to this list here. So also these compounds are showing this, so this uh, Berry curvature. So uh, even looking for antiferromagnets, so where you don't have a stray field, it's really an advantage if you want to make spintronics devices. So Stuart is doing also a lot by himself on this material. Looking for more unusual 
properties and very curvatures, even in materials where you don't expect it uh, before, is interesting. And so you will see there are an inflation of papers on these two materials nowadays, uh, because all in very good uh, journals because of based on this. Okay, they have also uh, here you see the Nernst effect picture from Nagasuchi's group, and you see also orders of magnitude larger. So what it means is simply even in normal conventional properties which are related to the Berry curvature, topology has a giant influence, you know. And we can simply go in areas where like new, new, new electronics, uh, uh, Nernst effect and so on, where we didn't expect uh, interesting stuff. Okay. Okay. So my last uh, part is then thinking about chirality coming back. Uh, this is based on a paper also thanks to Andre and Maya and so on. So like uh, when, when, when Andre recognized, okay, you can have a fourfold degeneration in Dirac, so twofold degeneration in Weil, and if you see spaghetti, okay, there are also crossing points with six and eight, so let's do a paper. <laughs> and one side effect was also that you can have chiral materials where you have this uh, chiral n-fold degeneration, but they are even at different energy. So I, I was, uh, I, I like this paper very much because there are still, I think, a lot of unexplored materials and interesting physics behind this, despite that there was a group of chiral materials. This was this B20 structure, I want to talk about this. And we also were working on this already because they have very nice fermions, okay? So going back, you know, I told you, real space and reciprocal space uh, 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 topologies, these fermions, are they related to some uh, also reciprocal space uh, uh, topology. So we, we already had crystals, uh, or we know how to grow these crystals in this class of materials. But there are also interesting superconductors. For example, still for applications, the most uh, important superconductors uh, are the A15 superconductors. And the A15 superconductors are also a new fermion. And I think they have also very interesting properties because they have also Van Hofer singularity, structure, charge, I think people think they are boring, but they're not. And they are non, uh, also chiral superconductors in this paper. So they are still, I think, uh, we still have materials on the list which we have not yet grown, but uh, I think uh, more to come. Okay. So, uh, yeah, and if you have this chiral material, it's nice because very similar, like the left handed and right handed molecules, you can make then crystals which have different chirality in non-tumors. But again, here also the research is very not really very well established because it's still challenging also to make like homochiral molecules. It's also very difficult to make homochiral crystals, so crystals of only one chirality. And there was another paper then follow up also of Hassan a few years later and so on when people recognize that these chiral uh, fermions are really uh, very interesting uh, from different so they, have, they are chiral in crystal structure, but this leads then that we have this uh, very special electronic structure also. So because lattice and electrons are coupled, as we know, and uh, so we have this uh, degenerated point here at the R point and the gamma point. And there was a nice commentary from Carlo Benek about this paper, which I still like, so because he cited Werner Heisenberg because uh, chiro this uh, chiral fermions go beyond Dirac and Y fermions, and Dirac and Y fermions have counterpart in high energy physics, and these new fermions don't have. And uh, already Heisenberg was speculating what can we do if we could make a lattice on the universe? We could maybe make new interesting things on in particle science. Unfortunately, our quasi hen, no, I think, doesn't allow that uh, electrons move into protons or something like that. Great. Completely great. But I still think this is also an area where theory could think more. I'm sure, sure that there are more interesting things discovered in this chiral fermions as properties, uh, despite of what we are doing. Oh, no. Okay. So, so for us, it's also so 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 simply interesting because if you think about chiral uh, uh, crystals, you already think about nonlinear objects. So I think this would even call for more optical experiments, you know. So now by uh, combining this, is like uh, that uh, 
there are interesting projections uh, prediction also that you should find this quantized circular photogalvanic effect, uh, but maybe also other. And the interesting thing is for me is like already if you see this figure, so one thing is if we have only chirality in the electronic structure like in the white semi-metals, so our white points are at the same energy so they can easily annihilate. We have the Fermi arc and this white points here. Here they are at different energies, so they are you cannot annihilate them, so the white points. But at the same time, so also the there are different positions in the in the in the Bryan zone. But uh, what I like very much is like that we have uh, we have uh, the chiral surface states in this material. So the bike electronic structure for both chirality, the band structure is exactly the same, but the phase is different. And therefore, I liked also Charlie's introduction in the very curvature and phase. I think there's maybe much more physics still in there and maybe even more impact uh, than we see. Okay, Because first, you see, if you normally talk to people who are related to chirality, they all think, OK, so what can you do with two chiral crystals? They have exactly the same band structure. Good. So, so therefore, so simply to demonstrate this is like simply drawing the picture so they have different uh, phases. And sometimes I think we maybe can learn from white semi-metals and the uh, new chiral fermions and each other so about more experiment because I was, for example, discussing with Jan Zhang what happens if I apply E dot B to white semi-metal should my photo galvanic effect uh, not be also quantized? And we should do it with the European compound of Maya because it should be, no? So we had the discussion with Adolfo last night. Also, he said, okay, yes, you, you really, because this would be nice, because there is a relation between the two. Okay, so and I like it very much because it also makes now, so we have chiral crystals, chirality in the electronic structure, but uh, can we learn something also for maybe chiral molecules? And this is. Uh, beyond the reach out people already do in biology, I don't want to go too far. But I think the nice thing is also that uh, the chiral fermions are not so rare because 30% of our uh, crystal symmetry groups are chiral. So it's not like there is a unique one or two. So we have 65 uh, of 230 are chiral of the space group. So we allow no... Uh, only rotation, no mirror, no inversion symmetry. So we can have enantiomorphic space groups which uh, exist in pairs, but we also can have archival space groups which can host chiral crystal structures. Anyway, so it's not a rare case. So I would say 30% of the material. And here again, we can grow uh, the crystals, but in some cases we are really lucky because it must be kinetics or the moonshine or whatever. So some crystals we can really grow as homochiral crystals and not with the uh, seeds. Simply by self flux we get, uh, sometimes we get this chirality, sometimes we get that chirality, but it's homochiral, but some crystals are grow also at intergrowth, okay? But we are able to really, also despite of doing X-ray, I think we can distinguish the enantiomers in X-ray. It's a little bit tricky and it's very local there are luckily also methods with electron diffraction where you really can characterize the whole crystal. So we can say this is crystal one enantiomer and this is the other enantiomer. So because if you only have a spot for X-rays here, like you know the crystal structure here, but you don't know the crystal structure here, but here we can really nicely scan it and we see uh, which area of the crystal is what has what chirality. So this is important for doing the experiment. And the band structure, as I said, is boringly the same, but therefore I like the emphasis, Charlie, on the phase. So we should look more which properties are related to the phase for sure. We can use optics, okay, because here we can use chiral light to really distinguish whether this, this uh, berry phase, this white point has uh, this sign or the other sign, okay. So this is really what I think distinguish us from uh, in the topological material it gives us a nice degree of freedom which you don't eventually have in a molecule, okay? So, and uh, this, uh, this material has this four-fold fermion at the gamma point and the six-fold uh, fermion at the R point. And as I said, first thing what to do is normally to do R plus 
and this was done in collaboration with uh, so uh, with Neil Schröter. So he really nicely could show the fourfold degenerated fermions and the sixfold degenerated. You already can make very nice uh, papers here in Arpus. I don't know. Okay, and then we could also show the uh, the chiral uh, Fermi uh, arcs here. There you need a little bit of fantasy. Uh, uh, because it's, it's easy to see here, but here on the other enantiomer it was a little bit more tricky. But uh, here you can also, so what was also possible here to count the churn numbers, so you know also the churn numbers uh, thanks to Kali, and they even have higher churn numbers in this uh, chiral fermions, uh, and you really can, thanks to the spin orbit splitting, which is in this palladium and platinum compounds very large, so you have enough resolution to see then two bands where you have to do, do bands and uh, you distinguish the surface state and you really can uh, uh, calculate them that you have really a uh, churn number of four in this material, uh, for this material. So, and you see also that the slope, uh, the sign is different for different uh, 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 materials here for the different enantiomers in this material. So because uh, they, uh, they have here this plus four and minus four. Anyway, so a similar experiment was done on cobalt silicide and rhodium silicide by Hassan. So it, the things always happen at the same time. He also saw this very nice, uh, nice chiral surface state. So, but this was for me also from the chemistry side very interesting that you have chiral surface states in materials where you have uh, chiral crystallinity and you have this phase. So this, uh, anyway, this is something you also see very nice. You can make these crystals also with very high quality to see the quantum oscillation, and you can even uh, identify the complex band structure in transport measurement. And what is also interesting, the SDM can then also verify again the Fermi arcs in this material. But I like also, if you go to defects, so you can see in the quasi-particle interference on the surface, that the defects are chiral for the two different enantiomers. And this thought brought me also to the idea we should do more on catalysis and enantiomer recognition on the surface of this material because if you have a kind of uh, defect which has some chiral electronic, uh, maybe it could be useful in context of uh, this interaction with materials. And then the obvious thing is to look with chi chiral light, so circular polarized light on the electronic structure of the two enantiomers. And this is really a way to see the difference in the Berry curvature. So I hope my other paper soon <laughs> gets ready. <laughs> uh, so, so you see nicely how the uh, two enantiomers look differently under circular polarized light, you know, so because uh, uh, so the band structure is not completely identical because we have the phase. We should really look more on the phase of the material, which is related to the S relation between the band curvature, also the orbital angular momentum. Um, yeah, and this is like where we are. So this is unpublished, and uh, I think Maya is working on the interpretation or on the data. But I think it's already impressive because it tells me what if I have two chiral crystals, two enantiomers. They are maybe more distinguished thanks to translation symmetry. And if you have surface state, uh, they maybe give us more handle also in direction of surface science of this using this kind of material. The other thing is uh, there was this prediction of the quantisicular photogalvanic effect from Joel Moore. And uh, so since rhodium silicide has still a very busy band structure, it's not as nice as it was expected, but you see, and there were very nice follow-up work from colleagues from your university. So like, uh, there's still some space, but you see also, they see evidence that uh, we could see it and we might have to find, what? Oh, my micro, oh. Nobody wants me before. I'm very bad with the micro. But I'm, we are not on Zoom, no, or we are. So we don't have to worry about the people, but you hear me, no? Okay, fine. Anyway, so I simply think also light matter interaction here again with this new fermions and chiral fermions is something interesting. So um, why I think also so 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 that it's interesting to think about uh, 
chemistry. So also like if you look for catalyst, uh, catalyst like which I use, what is the best catalyst for hydrogen evolution reaction? So the best catalyst for hydrogen evolution uh, reaction is platinum. And I already mentioned that platinum is a topological metal. And if you look for the Berry curvature, which is the element which has the non-magnetic element which has the highest Berry curvature, it's platinum. Okay, so it has a very good spin Hall effect, which there is a relation between the Berry curvature, but is eventually this uh, very nice surface state related also to 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 catalysis. And then you look for the competing reaction is oxygen evolution reaction. So if you split water, you want to have hydrogen and you want to have oxygen. The more challenging thing is even the oxygen. And the oxygen best catalyst for oxygen evolution reaction is the iridium oxide. And this is a nodal line. Uh, so it's also all these good catalysts are heavy element catalysts. This is also a little bit the problem, you know, because if you think about sustainability and hydrogen economy, if you want to build this, you might have to think about something else. But if we have topological effects at work, eventually it doesn't go <laughs> a different way. But uh, so this brought us simply to the idea also to look. We looked already for white semi-metals. And in white semi-metals, this I don't have here, but maybe simply mention, we saw also that we see uh, enhancement of the catalytic activity in the magnetic field, which is for me a sign it's uh, electrons which play a role. It's the topological electrons because it goes with the magnetoresistance effect. So our efficiency in catalysis goes with the magnetoresistance effect in vice. But here we did simply think, okay, let's start with hydrogen evolution reaction and uh, this, uh, this topological material because we have this wide energy range where, where we have the, 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 where the topological surface state lives and where we have uh, uh, around the Fermi energy. And indeed, so if you simply go with the classical Vulcano plot, you also see that this uh, absorption, so they, here the people look for, for efficiency versus the absorption of hydrogen uh, molecules. So, but the hydrogen molecules absorption also likes more to be absorbed on a surface which is has surface state. Uh, so you see this fits very well. But then here you see now the effect of the commercial uh, platinum, and you see that some of these compounds even perform better than commercial uh, catalysts. So, so this is already very promising. And the next step, what we did, we did a, use the mix mixture of uh, dopamine. So dopamine is a medicine against Parkinson's disease. And all this medicine, most of the medicine, all the cancer treatment thing, they are chiral. So therefore, uh, this is a big industry, the pharmaceutical industry, to make chiral molecules. And the L-dopamine you can use for Parkinson's disease, and the D-dopa is inactive. So what we did already, we saw also here, if we use this, uh, we, we do some electrochemistry to measure the absorption. We measure the re uh, redox reaction of this molecules and we see that it's asymmetric for the both enantiomeres. So you see one enantiomer like more the D-dopa, while the other enantiomer likes more the L-dopamine. So we are like now to go more into the direction of chemistry and maybe see whether there's a connection only chi structural chirality, but maybe also structure electronic chirality and so on, which are the knobs we can turn uh, maybe to go and reach out in direction of uh, uh, even heterogeneous asymmetric catalysis of chiral molecules. Yeah, this is a project which we already started in 2018 with Ben List, so he became very excited. He came to my lab and said, look, Claudia, I think topology, so he came with slides I can show where he showed white semi-metals. <laughs> so he got uh, the Nobel Prize last year for asymmetric uh, catalysis as a chemist. And so we have some projects and we are thinking about interaction and studying a little bit more about uh, chiral molecules with uh, chiral solids. So this is my personal reach out now more in a new direction uh, uh, where maybe topology can have some impact, okay? And he also mentioned that some people even thinking that, oh, it doesn't work, the movie, that uh, there is even a group of people or somebody from the ETH who thinks that uh, there is a, 
energy difference between the different DNAs, and this is based on the weak force. So, uh, but this is also not yet proven, okay? So simply bringing, so maybe the idea of uh, whether we can maybe use uh, even white metals at the end to separate uh, via the chiral anomaly uh, right and left-handed molecule would be my dream, because then you could say, in some sense, the crazy idea, maybe the origin of the universe has a similar origin than the origin of life, okay? So. This is, I come to my summary. I hope I have motivated you that topology can have maybe a lot of impact and can go beyond condensed metaphysics. And uh, if you think about future research directions, you maybe got some idea. And I'm hoping that soon I get many, many more predictions to do nice experiments and uh, the best magnetic topological materials for uh, thermoelectric conversion, maybe the best uh, new photovoltaic comes maybe from Liang Fu's group, and uh, maybe also some other crazy ideas. Thank you. Okay. 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 Yeah, thanks for the nice talk. So uh, why do surface states help for hydrogen catalysis? I would say surface state, the point is uh, hydrogen water splitting is a redox reaction. So you need electrons, okay? So, uh, and even the hardcore catalyst people say that, for example, mobilities from electrons help. But I would say also surface states play an important role, you know? So, and we even can prove it, honestly, so we have a nice paper with Andre about the obstructive atomic insulators, you know. If you, a very famous catalyst is MIS2. So it's a 2D material. You have the surface, the big surface, the basal plane, and you have the edges, okay. And people know since a long time the catalytic activity scales with the edges. But, and then if you look for the surface state, there's no surface state, and there's nothing, no activity on the basal plane. I, Unfortunately, you don't have a movie I could show you. Very impressive, okay? So on the buzzer plane, you have not a surface state. On the edges, you have surface state. So all the bubbles come, on, come from the edges. So then if you take f go from 2H, MOS2, to the white semi-metal MOS2, which uh, is slightly twisted, if you want. So, the, so it's a structural distortion, if you want. So then this also the buzzer plane has surface states. And now you have bubbles on the bu su surface state. The same you can do for, we did it for other catalysts. So this very nice database now with the obstructive atomic insulators where we have all the surface state also of beyond the topological surface state, this more semi-topological surface state. It's really impressive. We grow the crystals, we can, we can really see which surface, the surface which has the surface state uh, has bubbles and the surface without the surface state has no bubbles. So I'm quite convinced of this, but I think also on top we have mo the influence of mobilities, which we can prove with the magnetic field, because the mobility is a consequence. We calculate the mobility out of the magnetoresistance effect and conductivity, etc., and so on. And so you see a response to magnetic field. So I'm, I, I see the evidence. <laughs> Pretty cool. Thank you. But good question. Yeah, thanks. So what was the reason for, um, you said that in, they didn't believe that in an anti-ferromagnetic there would be Berry curvature, but it kind of depends on the other symmetries in the system, right? Or what was yeah. the argument? Yeah, but I think it's like before topology, the things have existed, but the people simply thought in an anti-ferromagnet you have this, uh, this, uh, this one spin z direction, the other, and uh, so because you have exactly the same, same, uh, same Berry curvature for each spin direction, and then they cancel out. So the sum of the Berry curvature is always zero. Okay, so so nobody was thinking that you can generate new uh, new symmetries even in an antiferromagnet uh, uh, that leads at the end to a ah. resulting Berry curvature. Okay, so the argument was more like of the not uh, off diagonal, but like the the conventional yeah. anomalous 
whole thing. So yeah, now you talk you. about off-diagonal and conventional. Uh, At this time, no, okay. so like like before, Ellen McDonald's work and and we run into the same problem without even yeah. thinking about this. You yeah, know, I didn't we simply look it was for so far back nobody. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It's not so long time. Oh, okay. <laughs> you were already born. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so but it's interesting. So this was a rule, you know. I was at many Sprintronics people, and people made a career on basically showing that the anomalous all effect goes with the magnetization. There's no anomalous all effect in anti Okay, thanks. But there is a lot of space now to generalize it to s find more interesting systems. Because they now they like all that you don't have a big magnetic stray field, and you can switch with this. Uh, tiny little moments which you still have there. The question is here, do we really for the experiment need the, the slightly little frustrated uncompensated moment to set the domains? Because the reason is why don't we see it in manganese 3 iridium? I don't know. Anyway, there's still a few open questions there.